Welcome back to another episode of How About That Podcast. It's actually the first time we can say welcome back to another episode because we're on episode two. This is April 2nd, day after April 1st we're recording. Um, I didn't get hit by any April Fools. I didn't fall for anything on Twitter. Um, Danny and Joey, did you guys get did you get caught by any uh, April Fools news or any fake Adam Schefters out there? I got one. I got one. What happened? Uh, I was at work and uh, my captain goes, uh, oh shit, uh, Brandon Ayuk just got traded to the Steelers. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, it happened for, for Pickens, uh, first and a second. I was like, mm, okay, that's a pretty decent haul. We had a full-on conversation about this trade that never happened. And uh, we get back to the station. I'm scrolling through Twitter. I'm like, I can't find this anywhere. And I'm like, what, what account was that by chance? And he goes, ah, yep, I think they got me. So, yeah, that's the one. Adam Schiefter got him, huh? Adam Schiefter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with two E's. Joey, did you get caught? No, I did not, but my dad did. And whenever he sees these things, I, I think it's not even an April Fool's joke with him anymore. I, it, I think he sends me a fake sports trade or news report once a week now. <laughs> um, and yesterday's was Justin – it was Steelers, Justin Jefferson getting traded to the Steelers, though. And I was just oh. like, what? So I look on Twitter just to, like, make sure I didn't miss anything, but yeah. And then I look and I find the exact like fake Adam Schefter account that it came from. And I'm like, you got, you got pranks dad. I'm sorry to tell you. Dude, I saw that one too. And the one that like, before I even got to like the at or even check the verification, because it had a photo, like, you know, breaking news with him. I'm like, Oh, that looks legit. But even the tone of the text on that one, I was like, this is obviously not real before I even had to double check. Cause it's like, Oh, it was like so casual. It's like, Oh, Justin Jefferson going to Pittsburgh. Another weapon for the Steelers. It's like, bro, if Justin Jefferson is going to the Steelers, we're not talking about him as another weapon for Pittsburgh. He's <laughs> you know, the he's the guy. He is. He's the dude. Um, but well, yeah, I'm glad that no one really got too caught. It's kind of wild in today's world that, like, Danny, to your point, you can have a full on conversation with about the future of Brandon Ayuk and the Steelers, only to find out that it literally is irrelevant and is not not true. Yeah, I was like, Russ is going to cook, man. Russ to uh, Ayuk. Could be something special. Russ went back to culinary school, man. He got his he got his cooking back, but and uh, uh, as a oh, Dodger fan as well, I also saw that uh, apparently Blake Snell had some UCL damage. Not that I would want to wish injury upon any player, but a part of me inside was like, yes, all these Giants yeah. fans I'm surrounded by. I was like, all that money you spent down the drain, and then fake. See, this is a little bit more insight into Danny, everyone. Um, Danny was not only a Cowboys fan in 49ers territory in San Francisco, he was a Dodgers fan in Giants territory growing up in San Francisco. You ask a lot of San Francisco people, they'd probably say that's worse uh, to be a Dodger fan. Um, <laughs> but, you know, then they'd flash three World Series in five years in his face, and it doesn't even matter anymore. And um, to which I say, quit living in the past. There's a reason the windshield's bigger than the rearview mirror, Joe. Look ahead. Don't look back. Yeah, and there's a reason why the 2020 season's kind of irrelevant. Um, you know, so, hey, enjoy that one World Series. Anyways, um, speaking of jokes, I think we need to talk about a very important topic before we really dive into all the Cowboy stuff. And that would be the new Taco Bell chicken cantina menu items. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say it's a joke, and we've talked about this off, off air, you guys don't agree with me. Or Joey's, Joey's doesn't even a Taco Bell fan. He just... He just wants a margarita on the beach at the Taco Bell in uh, Pacifica. Um, but, Danny, you like the Taco Bell menu. And I, as a Taco Bell aficionado myself, I was very disappointed. It's not that it was bad. Um, and I, for the record, I tried the quesadilla and the crispy chicken taco. It just wasn't up to the hype that I thought it would be. It was, it was good, not great, but I did enjoy it. I, too, had the quesadilla. I appreciated the uh, outer cheese uh, membrane, if you will, on the quesadilla. Um, and that green verde sauce, fantastic. It's got a little kick to it, a uh, little twang. I liked it. And uh, I paired that with the new burrito. I forgot the name of it. Um, I think it's just like the chicken cantina burrito or something like that. Something like that, yeah. But uh, you look on social media and the commercials, they advertise this big old, like, hearty burrito. And it was far from it, actually. It was small, but it was good. I'll give him that. And 
I didn't touch the guacamole because Taco Bell, they don't have their guacamole down quite right. But uh, 7.5 out of 10, which 10 o'clock at a restaurant drive through I'll, I'll take that any day for 15 bucks. See, that's the context that we needed from the beginning. I think you were a little delirious after a long firefighter shift. Um, I think anything would have would have hit that palate well. Um, that's that's my theory with you on this one. Well, you're a guy that enjoys a Mexican pizza from Taco Bell. Hoyt, so no, 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 no. Um, I can't believe you would even say that slander on our podcast. But, oh, well. Um, the reason we bring up Taco Bell, too, is not only to – you know, have different opinions on that. Um, and as we start a new podcast, that means you have to build an audience, right? It's not, it's not overnight unless you're, you know, Pat Mack be going to ESPN or something that you have a huge base. So I had this idea to try and grow the audience and we'll, we'll get the particulars. Joey, you'll weigh in on a little bit of this ideas here. We'll do a little brainstorming session right now. I think that if we get a certain amount of either downloads or reviews or just straight up listens across this podcast over a certain time period, that I want to do this thing called the Taco Bell Mile. Uh, the beer mile is something that's become pretty famous. Um, and that's where people drink a beer, chug a beer before a lap. And they have to do that four times over, obviously, to run a mile. Um, and then they do the times. There's even a world record for fastest time. I thought it'd be really funny to do a Taco Bell mile where you have a different Taco Bell item before every lap. And now I think I can do it because I'm such a big Taco Bell guy. Um, I don't think it's going to hit well, um, but I think it would also be pretty entertaining. Um, we'll get odds, live odds on whether or not I can, you know, not puke. I think that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> so that's something that I'm throwing out to you guys and to the audience um, as we try to grow it. Hey, if we get a certain amount of listens, subscribers, whatever it may be, um, I will do a Taco Bell mile. Danny? My first question to that is, do I pick the items or do you? Because that has a lot to do with it. Or does the audience pick? Maybe we put it up to the audience. J Joey, what do, you, what do you think about that? Why not? You pick one, Danny picks one, I pick one, audience picks one. That, that that works actually pretty well. Um, so, okay. So do we have an idea? I think, Joey, you're the guy for this on like what a good number over a certain time period would be. F full disclosure, everyone, I have uh, a septoplasty, a sinus surgery on April 9th, which means I can't run for a little while. So this will have to, this is going to be over a, a span of time. So I'm hoping that we can keep this going and build up the audience a little bit, uh, build the anticipation a little bit, if you will. The excuses are already coming. The, the wow. surgery the surgery is just time to uh, fill in for training to get ready for this so he doesn't embarrass himself. No, if, when we film this, I want to do like a montage, like like a you know Rocky style working out thing right before. And obviously, it'd be pretty funny because all I could probably do in the beginning is walk. Um, but yeah, what do you? What would be a good number? And we can we can don't have to finalize it now. Like a good number of like what just listens, downloads. What do you think? Yeah, so we can do downloads, and it. I have a question based off your question in terms of how achievable do you want this to be and in what question time? inception. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. How, like, do you want it to be a very realistic one? One that's like somewhat likely to happen or do you want, want it to be one that would have to be somewhat of a surprise and like, Oh wow. Like we reached this number. That's awesome. Now I'll run this. No, I, I, I think I want to, I want to, you know, I'm a man of the people. I want to give them something. So I want to make this realistic, but I do want to have it be an incentive that grows our podcast. Okay. How about so record straight? Sorry. This is for you to do right. And me to just enjoy. <laughs> this is for me to do. I think now, but Danny, I think, uh, you know, as a part of this podcast, as we continue to grow, uh, we can't get complacent. Um, and I think we're going to need you to at least pitch in at some point. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it, but I'm going to enjoy this. All right. Well, I mean, we're a baby right now. So I would say as a podcast, if we got 200 downloads on a podcast, that'd be good. That's like a nice little step into the multi, the like couple hundred section. I think that'd be a good landmark for you to do this. How unrealistic would 500 be? Unrealistic? Or how, mean, about, how about also, what if we did it by like, a monthly thing how many downloads in a month like if we try to keep this going like yeah well it depends on how long because i mean a few hundred hopefully a few thousand and then you know it just keeps gradually getting there 
I don't know exactly when we would reach like what are you are you thinking 500 monthly 500 in a month or are you thinking 500 in an episode what if we did like what if once we hit the 2500 mark i'll do it in a month in a month okay i think that's that doable? it won't happen in month one or month two most likely i don't know what month it specifically will happen but i think that's a good achievable goal for a podcast that has eight, around eight episodes a month. Okay. How about this? Uh, this comes out Thursday, April 4th. Um, what if by May, if we get 2,500 downloads by May 15th, I'll do the talk about mile. If we get 2,500 downloads by May 15th, you should do two talk about miles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how about 2000, 2000? That seems that's okay. that's it's incentivized. That's not a slam dunk, but it's also it, it feels doable. Okay, maybe I'm crazy. May fifteenth. Okay. That's our deadline. Yes, lock it in. It's locked okay. in. Okay, Boom. so across platforms, two thousand downloads from this point on. We'll include episode one two to May fifteenth. If we can get that, I will do a Taco Bell mile. We'll film it. We'll do odd live odds. Danny will take care of that, setting the odds on whether I puke or not, and prop bets and all that. You know, well, maybe not in Texas because that's not allowed yet. Uh, theoretically, or California. <laughs> um, we'll do theoretical odds, and then we'll go from there. All right, sound good? Yeah, perfect. I'd like all right, open, I like to open the odds at two to one that uh, Joe pukes on the uh, mile. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Um. Okay, well, that's now on that note, let's dive right into Cowboys news because, you know, we're now about 12 minutes in and I, I you know, I think it's about time. Uh, so Cowboys, the first thing I wanted to talk about with the Cowboys today was actually something that I heard over Easter uh, Mass. Um, and this kind of also goes with the theme of building the podcast a little bit um, and kind of hearing from our audience. But basically, the priest at our church did his homily and talked about how, like, you know, hey, we're all here for Easter Sunday. You know, there's a lot of people, there's hundreds and hundreds of people at this mass, but everyone kind of came to this mass for the same thing, but from a different path. Um, they're all here to celebrate Easter, but the way that people found, in this case, faith uh, was different for everyone, right? And he kind of told the story about how, hey, I wasn't even Catholic. One day, in need of direction, I stumbled into a church and I just said, hey, you know, God, if you're there, help me out. I need direction. He heard something, boom, he becomes a priest, and now he's an hilarious priest years later, right? Um, that's how his path was into becoming, you know, into faith. I think that everyone also has a different path into fanhood. Um, I think there's so many Cowboys fans out there. Um, they're obviously America's team, but there's a lot of international effect too. And I think we'd lo- it would be really fun to hear from Cowboys fans about what their path into being a cowboy fan is what is their story? Why why are they Cowboys fans? Whether they're from, you know, Piscataway, New Jersey, or in Danny's case, San Bruno, California, I think it'd be really interesting to do that. We'll we'll put pose that question. Hopefully, we'll get some responses. We'll read them out on the podcast. I think that'd be kind of interesting just to see the unique paths into Dallas Cowboys fanhood. Speaking of that, Danny Morales, <laughs> how did you become a Cowboys fan in enemy territory in San Francisco? If I had a dollar every time I've been asked that question throughout my life, I would probably never have to work. Um, <laughs> yeah, so being from the Bay Area, obviously this is not Cowboys territory, even though we are America's team. Uh, my dad is actually a Cowboys fan along with his siblings, and my mother is a Niner fan. So it's a house divided. And so when I was born, a little baby, uh, my mom bought me a 49er little puffer jacket and uh, I refused to wear it. She said she tried and tried and tried, and I would not put it on. And then my dad gave me a cowboy shirt, never wanted to take it off. And, of course, every boy wants to be like his dad. And so I just kind of emulated what he did. And from that point on, I was a Cowboys fan my entire life. I've gotten a lot of shit for it, but I've never, never wavered. And now my wife, who's kind of neutral on football so it's kind of like a blank a blank uh canvas so naturally i had to buy her a dak prescott jersey so now she is uh she's part of the cowboys family as well well so that was her path into cowboys fanhood danny 
if you feel okay with this, and we haven't talked about this off air, will you tell the people what she told you in her vows about Cowboys fandom? Yeah, without getting too specific or word for word, she basically vowed to always support the Cowboys, even though I've never been alive to see a Super Bowl. So she took a little she took a little shot at the, the Cowboys family there, but she did vow to always be a supporter. So she's got well, that going. Well, shout out to Alyssa. Um yeah. uh the saint that she is and uh, even willing to also join the enemy territory inside San Francisco bubble, which um, you guys now proudly, you know, pr- yeah, proudly showcase. Um, but yeah, so that's, I think that'd be kind of a fun thing. Danny, your path is very interesting. Obviously it can't, it kind of seemed a little bit of a Nate thing with you that, you know, Cowboys fandom was going to be in your future. It chose um, me. I didn't choose it. I feel like that happens for a lot of people. So yeah, if audience, Send in some stories. Uh, you can send them to me on Twitter. Um, I'll pose that question there too on TikTok, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, and hopefully we hear some good ones and we'd love to share them um, as we kind of build this audience that's, you know, for fans and, and in Danny's case, by fans. Um, all right, let's go to some news and notes. How about that? Um, we have a lot of news updates from a draft perspective on top 30 visits or not top 30 visits, just 30 visits. Um, I think sometimes the recruiting jargon of top 12 and top 16 has kind of got its way into the top 30. Anyways, um, a lot of guys uh, were confirmed to be coming today um, on Tuesday, April 2nd. So we'll go through the list a little bit and some notable names here, Danny. Um, We've got Oregon State offensive tackle Talisi Fuaga, Oregon running back Bucky Irving, Florida State running back Trey Benson, Oregon center Jackson Powers Johnson. Then we have Graham Barton, um, who, you know, we've talked about. We also have Michigan linebacker, Junior Colson, Wisconsin running back, Braylon Allen, and Missouri defensive lineman, Darius Robinson, who was the Senior Bowl MVP. So that's who was reported by Nick Harris, who works for the Dallas Cowboys, um, on Tuesday. Um, there's some other names, though. Let's run through them really quick. We got Pitt offensive tackle, Matt Kinkavs, or Kinkov. I can't, I don't know how to say his last name, but it, it spells Cavs at the end, which I think is funny. I hope he has really good Cavs. I think it's uh, good this. Is it Concavus? Matt Goncalves? I can't confirm that, but... I kind of like Cavs, though. You know, I mean, hopefully sure. it's really some Cavs. That works. Um, <laughs> uh, there's Kentucky linebacker Trevin Wallace. Uh, Washington offensive tackle Troy Fountain, who would, you know, we'll talk more about him again later. Texas A&M linebacker Edrin Cooper, who is an absolute bullet, um, you know, in the defensive linebacker core. Speaking mm-hmm. of bullets in the linebacker core, NC State linebacker Peyton Wilson. Uh, Texas running back Jonathan Brooks, who's extremely interesting, might be the most talented running back in the draft. Um, and should be good to go by training camp, but obviously had a season-ending injury at Texas last year. Uh, Western Kentucky wide receiver Malachi Corley. Temple linebacker Jordan McGee. Uh, Marshall running back Rasheen Ali. And Mississippi State linebacker Nathaniel Watson. So um, I don't have the exact numbers up, but that's a lot of names now on our on the 30-visit schedule. Danny, just hearing that, what jumps out to you? There's some pretty – Pretty big names on there. Um, we touched on a couple of them in uh, in the first episode. Uh, one name that jumped out to me uh, was Jordan McGee as a Temple linebacker. Any any guy wearing a single digit number at Temple, you know, is a is a dog. They don't just take those numbers too lightly over there. So I like that. But uh, the name that really stood out to me as an option or a fit for the Cowboys was uh, Western Kentucky receiver Malachi Corley. Um, built like a running back, kind of like that Debo Samuel mold. And I feel like that's kind of an element the Cowboys are missing a little bit right now. you got some field stretchers. you got C.D. Cooks. Obviously, C.D. can go over the middle as well. But uh, just to have that quick game, those slants, the screens of uh, Malachi Corley. And obviously, he wasn't going against your your Wigginses or your Kool-Aid McKinstries in Conference USA. But what he did against that level of talent was pretty impressive. You watch that Louisiana Tech game. And to see him just bury that defender in the turf, like, wow, I could see that. I could see that happening in Dallas. So maybe day two, second, third round pick, something like that, he's getting some steam. His name's coming up a lot, so he might be rising up draft boards, but that's a name I'd love to see in Dallas. Yeah, he definitely seems to have kind of been that darling of the draft process in terms of like a comp, like a specific player comp, because I think since the Niners drafted Debo Samuel in 2019, um, 
people have been trying to find Debo 2.0. You know, everyone's like yeah. Traylon Burks next Debo Samuel. And like, obviously still jury's still out on that. But like, I think that's one of the dangers of the draft process is especially with scouts that do this year in and year out is you see a couple things like, oh, that reminds me of this guy. And then you, in your mind, it kind of just goes, oh, then he can be that guy in our system. But obviously every system's different. Every circumstance is different. And every, just because you have one thing about a guy doesn't mean you're going to be him. That being said, to your point, he's got, he's got a little bit of Debo in him. <laughs> and I, he does. Uh, I mean, Cowboy fans know straight up what Debo can do. And, you know, he's, that's a physical body, a great yak guy that could kind of come in and, you know, add that element to the Cowboys. I think CD this year in particular was an incredible yak machine. Um, dude, his ability to like sense other tacklers, you know, like when he's running, like I swear he kind of has eyes in the back of his head. That's what it feels like. Um, yeah, he had a couple plays this year that were fantastic. Um, but Malachi Corley would be nice. Yeah, kind of see that little that dog in him. He kind of brings that that energy that I think I think Dallas was missing last year, especially in the playoffs coming out flat. You need a tone setter like that. Someone's going to put, like I said, a DB in the turf, set the tone for that game. Yeah, I think that would have been helpful. Um, so, yeah, keep an eye on that. There's a lot of Cowboys visits coming up. That's about half the list um, of 30 guys. So not every 30 visits going to be publicized, by the way. Um, but those are some notable ones, especially at the top end of the draft. They could have some options for the Cowboys at 24. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to our chase for the Rose later on. Um, God, I love that title. Um, all right. Another news and note. Um, Deron Bland got paid. And not the big extension that you know he might eventually get. But he did get paid. Um, he nearly got his salary doubled for 2023, um, because of the NFL's performance incentive program or performance program. I forgot the exact wording, but it's a, um, basically what the NFL does is they give a million dollars in performance bonuses to every single team that doesn't count against the cap. Um, and then they split it based on a certain amount of index points, all that stuff. Um, Danny, it doesn't take a, uh, uh, analyst in elite football mind to realize that Deron Bland had a highly productive 2023 the guy's a stud uh another one of those guys that pff loves um he does tend to get burned sometimes it hurts me to say that because he does take his risk kind of like your trayvon Diggs. but sometimes you got what they say risk it to get the biscuit not to be too cheesy there but uh yeah i'm all for it i'm down to keep him for a long time you pair, pair him with trayvon Diggs, and your your secondary is looking pretty good for a while yeah, I think the trio of Trayvon Diggs, and of course, coming back from injury, we saw it last year sometimes, it takes time. Yeah. Um, we'll see exactly how quickly he can come back. But the idea of having two ball hawks in Trayvon Diggs, Deron Bland, and then a very, very savvy player in Jordan Lewis. Jordan Lewis, yeah. Um, who just kind of gets it. Another guy who came off in crazy injury. Um, you know, we've I've wrote about that before on LoneStarLive.com. But you can learn more about Deron Bland's new incentive program on LoneStarLive.com, where you can find all our Cowboys coverage. Um, you know, we, me and Joey are producing a lot of content over there. So be sure to check that out in addition to the pod. Um, all right. Now we're getting to just kind of some bigger Cowboys talking segments. And speaking of guys getting paid, um, one guy that's been kind of now on the radar at least in the ether for the Cowboys to kind of add to the running back room is one Ezekiel Elliott, uh, who the Cowboys said, you know, just last year, Hey, we're going to give you a lot of money to go away. And now the door seems kind of open to returning. Um, you know, they release him where it was all set for the Rico Dattle, Tony Pollard, Malik Davis kind of combo, um, Deuce Vaughn in the backfield. Um, this year, it didn't. The running back room was not up to kind of snuff, not up to expectations. Then Tony Pollard left and signed with Tennessee. Now the Cowboys have Rico Dowdle, Deuce Vaughn, Hunter Lepke, Malik Davis, Snoop Connor, and they're lacking a veteran. Um, I think they're going to go pick someone in the draft too. But, but Danny, just hearing this news, you know, he counts against their cap this year for six million dollars already. Last year he was five point eight million dollars, so that's two. That's eleven point eight million dollars in cap hits across two years for a guy that you might welcome back. To be honest, my initial reaction when I saw that one, um, I was like, come on, what, what are we doing? Um, 
he he had a little bit left in the tank in New England, but I understand you're still paying him and and all that. But to me, it doesn't make a ton of sense. I don't really see a whole lot of game changer left in his skill set. And to be honest, if you're going to take a running back like the Whispers are saying around two or three, I understand the whole concept of learning behind a veteran. And I'm sure Zeke has a lot to pass on to a rookie back that maybe Rico Dowdle or obviously Deuce Vaughn being young don't have. But to me, I, I feel like you're just going to halt or stunt the growth of your Trey Benson, your Bucky Irving, your Audric Estime, whoever you take, whoever the guy's going to be. I feel like you're just doing them a disservice by taking snaps away from them that they're really going to need, especially with the with the career span of running backs being so short as it is. That first five years is so key. Why waste it and have, have him sit behind a guy like Zeke? Yeah, the one thing Zeke, though, did in Dallas, not as much last year in New England. A quick rundown of what he did last year in New England. Averaged three and a half yards per carry. Um, had 642 rushing yards in total. Um, if you want to get more analytical or more subjective analytical with it, um, he had a pro football focus overall rushing grade of 69.2. That was 47th among qualified running backs and one spot behind one Rico Dowdle, just to give a little context of where Zeke was obviously a guy Cowboys know, but Dallas did struggle in short, especially in the early in the season in short yardage situations, kind of seemed that they were lacking a tone setter. I mean, I, obviously the question is how much of a tone can Zeke set now? Um, but you know, I mean, that's something they lacked last year, Danny. Yeah, he was, he was a fan favorite. I got a Zeke Jersey. I was a fan. I was all about it. Jumping in the, jumping in the bucket on Thanksgiving, but to me, like, I don't, I don't really see him taking us to that next level. I don't see what he can add to the team that we we're really missing last year that we can't find in the draft. So to me, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Kind of like also seeing the Dalvin Cook rumor, the same same type of thing. It's like we're getting these guys in the back end of their careers, and we're already pretty pretty tight against the cap. I, it just doesn't doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Do they need another veteran to go along with Rico Dowdle and a draft pick? I don't think they need quantity as much as quality in the position. Um, I think if you go into the season with, like I said, your Benson, your your right, your estimate, whoever it's going to be, with Dowdle and, and Deuce Vaughn, I think you're pretty you're feeling pretty good about that room, especially if you can sure up the O line. Um, that's just kind of how I feel about that. Yeah, I think too. That's kind of the one question mark from last season was, hey, we know for a fact that the run game was not up to standard. Um, it did not meet expectations. Mike McCarthy said so um, in you know, his press conference when he was officially going to return. That needs to be improved. The question is, what was the main cause? Was it running backs that weren't performing, hitting holes? Or was it an offensive line that kind of struggled to create them? And if you look at pro football focus last year, the offensive line from the run blocking scenario uh, standpoint did not do that well. Tyler Smith was a monster at left guard. Um you know, as we get forward in this podcast, we'll talk about his future um, a little bit more about whether you keep him at left guard or moving to left tackle. Um, Tyron Smith was fantastic in pass pro, left a little bit to be desired in the running game. Um, mm -hmm. You know, which is kind of to be expected for a guy who's going in, who's in his thirteenth season. Uh, Tyler Biotish, while athletic, um, didn't grade that well as a run blocker in Pro Football Focus, so. And, you know, the, the, it's funny. The funny thing about all that is you start talking about that, and that's two starting spots that they haven't even filled yet um, yeah. <laughs> in the left tackle and center. And, and that's kind of where I'm at, too. It's like you're going to address the running back position. That's great. But when the interior of your line is not shored up yet, like the amount of times, I'm sure you could attest, the amount of times that Pollard was getting hit in the backfield, the guy, he had no chance. It didn't matter who you had back there. He was pretty much left for dead, um, didn't have – too many holes to run through to use that straight line speed that he has. So I think until you shore up that interior, you're running back secondary to that. No, I completely agree. And that's just another question mark moving forward. Uh, speaking of questions, um, the future of one Dak Prescott, speaking of guys um, from that draft class um, with Zeke Elliott, um, Dak situation is very interesting. Um, as we all know, we've talked about it a little bit on the previous podcast, but Dak Prescott is going into an expiring year of his contract. With that being said, he also cannot be traded without his consent. 
and he cannot be franchised or transition tagged, which means the path, as Ian Rappaport reported not too long ago, is trending towards him hitting the market in free agency in 2025, which is a, not something that happens often. I mean, realistically, how many good quarterbacks hit the market, especially at the age of 31, 32, when they're doing well? I mean, it's pretty much, if you look at it, it's been Kirk Cousins. <laughs> Twice. <Not it. laughs> yeah. Last time when he signed a guaranteed deal with the Vikings, and then this mm-hmm. time when he signed with the Falcons. And if Kirk Cousins coming off an injury can get a four-year, $180 million deal, which is similar to what Dak got last time around at the age of 35 and coming off an injury, what would Dak Prescott get this, this coming uh, free agency in 2025? I, Danny, I think it would be, I think it'd be obviously record setting, I think. Um, Cause at the end of the day, a lot of teams are desperate for someone who can lead them to what Dak Prescott has done. And that's three consistent playoff performances or consistent paths to the playoffs every single year. You can't argue the regular season production. I mean, people say what they want about Dak in the playoffs, but at the end of the day, the numbers are the numbers, and the guy puts up stats. He's easily a top 10 quarterback, in my opinion, and I think in most people's opinions. And you look around the league, and it's like the teams that win all have an elite quarterback. Um, you can argue whether Brock Purdy's elite or not, but for the most part, the top, the upper echelon of this league, it starts at the quarterback position, and he's got all the leverage in the situation. He knows how good he is. He knows elite quarterbacks are a pretty hot commodity in the NFL. And I think he's going to use that to his advantage. And he's, I don't know about record setting. I don't know about Mahomes money, but he's definitely going to bring in quite a decent penny. And the thing too, thanks for bringing up Mahomes because I kind of forgot about him. I don't know how. Um, Kind of a big deal. Yeah, no big deal. Just, you know, two-time (laughs) back-to-back Super Bowl champion, never goes anywhere short than the AFC championship, whatever, you know, it's fine. Um, but I'm glad you brought up leverage too. And this is kind of the other talking point I want to bring up about the Dak Prescott contract. We talked about the no f- franchise tag. We talked about no trade clause. Dak Prescott also has this idea of leverage in the sense that they've already done this dance before the Cowboys and Dak Prescott. They've already done the stare down saying, Hey, you know, let's do a contract. Um, extension oh you want to franchise tag me okay well now let's get an extension done and danny i want you like this is something you probably have a little bit more knowledge of um it felt like a stare down and it felt like hey everyone's saying the right things and you know the cowboys look like they're not going to budge they're going to stand strong Dak prescott's not going to budge and ultimately it looks like the cowboys caved a little bit especially when you consider the franch no franchise tag and no trade clause in that deal um so my point being, not only does Dak Prescott have leverage, he has experience, and he can totally call the Cowboys bluff if he wants to. Because at the end of the day, either the Cowboys cave, and they give him a way more expensive deal than they could have probably gotten last year or earlier this offseason to do it either right before you know next season before he becomes a free agent, um, or he hits the market and becomes extremely rich for a team that really probably really wants him. Um, what do you remember about that first contract tango? Dak uh, yeah, again, it's like like you said, Dak has the leverage because if not Dak, then what? If you don't have your quarterback, you don't really have much. Um, and the Cowboys have really no one to blame but themselves for getting themselves into this situation. Um, get that extension done, restructure, whatever you got to do. And now they've put themselves in this cap nightmare where they're going to have to pay Dak. I don't see Jerry going in on a rebuild. He's got... He's kind of like that ego, um, kind of like that Al Davis where I want to win. I want to win now. I don't want to rebuild. I don't want to tell the fans we're going to rebuild. So I think ultimately he's going to find a way to get something done. The way they went about it, not ideal because they kind of hurt themselves for building around Dak. But I think ultimately something's going to get done. It's going to have to get done. I think the NFL is known for death taxes and like financial inflation in terms of contracts. I mean, every year we know that the salary cap's going to go up, which means every year the percent value that a quarterback has in said salary cap, the percent might say the same, but that means the value goes up. And so it's just going to get more expensive and more expensive, and they seem willing to let it go there. Or this is one thing I wanted to 
touch base with a fan about. Is there a realm where they say, hey, man, you know, we like what you've done. We've liked that we've gotten to this point. But the postseason record is kind of undeniable, um, especially considering this last season. I, I think this was the most shocking playoff loss they've had um, in recent memory. Um, is there an element of, hey, if we can't if we can't get over the top with you, then what are we doing? I, it's really hard to imagine a world in which Dak is not under center for the Cowboys. And I feel like he gets unfairly criticized for that lack of postseason success. Sure, as a quarterback, you're going to take the blame for it and it falls on your shoulders, but Dak wasn't playing defense. Dak wasn't the one stopping the run. Dak wasn't the one blowing coverages. That happens year after year in the playoffs. He's doing what he can. Can he do a little more? Sure. But I do think he gets unfairly criticized for the lack of postseason success. No, and I completely agree with you. And I think at the end of the day, every team walks into an NFL season saying, do we have a shot at winning a Super Bowl? At least that's what they should be asking themselves. And with Dak Prescott as your quarterback, I believe that you have a shot. Um, Obviously, there's other factors to go with it. But I think Dak Prescott has earned that right. And I think a reality without him – even though Jerry Jones said he does not fear it, I think maybe they should. Um, also of note for the quarterbacks <laughs> for the quarterback room next year in Dallas. Uh, right now, no, they have no quarterbacks on the roster in 2025. Uh, Trey Lance is not going to get his fifth year option picked up, even though he'll be on the roster this year, so he'll be a free agent. Cooper Rush said to be a free agent. Dak Prescott said to be a free agent, and Dak Prescott right now, due to void years in his deal has a 40 million, roughly $40 million cap hit next year, whether he's on the roster or not. Uh, so wh- how much confidence does that give Cowboys fans? <laughs> not a lot, especially knowing you gave up a fourth to get Trey Lance for his fifth year option and not get picked up. And it's like, for what? For him to sit behind Cooper Rush his entire Dallas career? Kind of makes you wonder. It's a head scratcher. Maybe they have a long-term plan that we don't know about. I don't know. Time will tell. Yeah. Um, especially as other deals have gone for that draft class, it kind of makes you wonder if they would have just sat back and, yeah. you know. But, I, hey, at the end of the day, a fourth-round pick, what that gave them was the chance to evaluate him early. Um, so maybe they already have the answer on him. You know, I mean, it's kind of hard to evaluate a guy that's not in your system unless until he's in your system. Um, yeah. And they worked a lot with him last year. I do think preseason will be interesting with him. I do think it's going to be interesting to see if they draft a quarterback. Um, I'm not, I don't, maybe like I, 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 I'm definitely not ruling that possibility out considering that there's no one in the quarterback room next year, but it'd be interesting to see what they did. Like, what if they did take another kind of project guy like Joe Milton, you know, in the fourth round, or like, what if, or what if Jordan Travis, who's coming off an injury is there late and they're like, Hey, why not take a flyer on a guy that we don't really need to play that much this year, obviously. I could see that sixth, seventh UDFA, but anything in the first five rounds, I think you just have so many other glaring holes on this roster that you're just doing yourself a disservice with that. I just say bring Ben DiNucci back. That's uh, that's all I'm saying. Ben DiNucci, uh, the Seattle Sea Dragons? Am I correct? Uh, the Sea Dragons, Danny, don't even exist anymore. Uh, oh. they, they, they got lost in the UFL, XFL, USFL. Oh, merger. Yeah, man. So RIP to the Sea Dragons. Um, what a run uh, with Ben DiNucci. I, he might be on a t- he, I think he might be on a roster, though, in the NFL, actually. He's got to be somewhere. Yeah, man. Well, if, he's everywhere in Dallas with those hats. If, if anything, he was entertaining. Yeah. Name that college, Danny. Ben DiNucci? Uh, was he James Madison? I believe so. Am I right on that? Yeah, I think so. Oh, dude, I forgot to do our Cowboys trivia with you. Okay, we're going to do that quickly. So, um, sorry, Joey. I know I said 45 minutes. probably going to go a little bit longer. Uh, So, I found this TikTok account. This guy named Colts.WalterPicks is his name. And he's been doing this fun... Yeah, Walter Picks. um, Play on interceptions. Maybe he likes Picks. Maybe that's his last name. I don't know. Obvious Colts fan. Uh, But he's been doing this series on TikTok where he goes through every team in the NFL over the last, I think it's 20 years, 22 years, however fantasy football has been kind of really around. And he finds the best quarterback performance, the best running back performance, the best wide receiver performance, 
the best tight end performance, the best kicker, and the best defensive and special teams performance in a single game in that team's history over the last 20 years in fantasy. Okay. So I'm going to I'm gonna quiz you, Danny, as a Cowboys fan. I'll give you three lives to it get through. like a loaded question already, but okay. How is that loaded? It's just a trivia question. Sure. Okay. This is a, I'm trying to test your fanhood here. This is, was, this is, this was a lot of lead up. Yeah, there was. So who, which quarterback, and all you have to do is give me the name. Don't have to give the year. Don't have to give the, the game or anything. Um, you just have to give me the name of the quarterback that had the best performance in Cowboys history over the last, um, I think it's roughly 22 years in fantasy. Some of the quarterbacks kind of an easy way to get into this. I feel like you got a 50-50 shot on that. I'm going to go – I'm going to say Dak Prescott against Cleveland. You don't – okay, too specific, but I think – No, but that's I, – I, yeah, that game he went off. That was the year – the injury year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're wrong. So, 0 for 1. Uh, quarterback – Joey, do you have a guess here? The the non Cowboys fan, you know, hey, this is this is a tough question now for you. It's not Quincy Carter, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Over the last twenty years, yeah. Oof. Just the specific player, not the year. No, just specific player quarterback. Mm-hmm. It's not Dak Prescott. It's got to be Tony Romo then. Right? It's Tony Romo, two thousand thirteen, against the Denver Broncos. Um, I think he had like six touchdown passes, five or six touchdown passes, maybe an interception. Had forty point nine four total points that game. Mm. So Danny, you've lost one life in this already. Um, running back is, I'll tell you this right now is not easy. Um, I'll even give you a hint. It's on the earlier age or years of this, not, not recent memory. Okay. Which running back had the best fantasy performance in Cowboys history over the last like 22, 23 years. Are we talking post Emmett Smith? You tell me. Like I've DeMar- given you a hint. It, it's in the earlier parts of the – this me, one's tough me, for you. Let me think out loud here. Okay, so DeMarco had some big games, mm-hmm. but I think that's too obvious. Tashard Choice had some decent games, but mm-hmm. nothing record-setting. Felix Jones had some big games. And based off the way you're looking at me, that could be the answer. Or is that my poker face? There's also Marion Barber. He had some big games, too. I'm going to go with Felix Jones. The poker face got you. It's not Felix Jones. I'll give you one more guess, and it's not any of the guys you mentioned. What? It's a tough one. It's a tough one. Can, can I get a year, maybe? 2004. 2004. So I was in fourth grade for this performance, huh? Yeah, here comes the excuse. But go okay. ahead. Fourth grade running back. What college did he go to? I'm double checking. Uh, Notre Dame. Oh, uh, oh God. Uh, Julius Jones. Julius Jones in 2004. Right. Had a 41.9 fantasy performance against the Seattle Seahawks. Wow, Joey. Joey, while we're talking about this, can you maybe go and like reference and find that game and just because I forgot exactly what the yardage was. Okay. Um. All right. So I'm not going to take a lie from you on that one because you got it after the second guess. Um, <laughs> wide receiver. CD Lamb. No. Wow. Hmm. Not C.D. Lamb, huh? No. Uh, other Amari Cooper? Amari Cooper, 2018 against the Eagles, had 49.7 fantasy points. Was that a home game? I think so. If it was, I was there. The only time I've ever been to Cowboy Stadium was that. Game. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow, you got to get out here more, man. I know. I love it. All right. Tight end is also not easy. So you got you're down to one life. I'll give you I'll give you one more pass though. So I'll give you two more laps. Tight end's not easy. I'll even give you I'll give you eh, no the year would be kind of a giveaway. Um it's not easy though. Well the obvious answer is Jason Witten. Which okay, it's not. Which is sh- which is shocking, isn't it? Is it Dan Campbell? No, it's not Dan Campbell. <laughs> that would be really good though. 
Um, no, it's not Dan Campbell. Wow. This is a, a lot of, there, there was some hype for this guy. Um, obviously had a big game or two, but a lot of hype, huh? I mean, not a lot of hype, but like the only hyped tight end I could think of that didn't do a whole lot was Gavin Escobar. No, no, not Gavin Escobar. Um, this guy, this guy wasn't bad. Like, but like, I kind of remember, and maybe I'm misremembering and I'm just kind of throwing you off course here. Uh, you know, people thought heir apparent, I think Jay Witt and heir apparent to Jason Witten. I might be leading down the path. Reminder, everyone, I just started covering the Cowboys in th- this year. Um, I know you're not talking about James Hanna. No, not, not James Hanna. <laughs> I don't know. You got me. You stumped me on this one. All right, I'll give you the year. 2018. Oh, so it's pretty recent. He was the tight end along with James Hanna behind Jason Witt. Oh, God, I should know that. Um, I'm drawing a blank. You want me to tell you? Yeah, yeah. Blake Jarwin in 2018 against oh, the Giants. Blake Jarwin. 36.9 points. Texas Longhorn, right? Was he a, was he a Longhorn? He was Texas or Oklahoma State. I... Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State. Yeah. Well. Damn. All right. Uh, you're on your last life. Kicker. And uh, defense and special teams. Kicker, I'll give you a hint. Which, actually, I don't even know if this is much of a hint. Uh, this is w- 2003 is the year. Martin Gramatica. No, that's a good guess, though. Um, that's a good guess. And now uh, I'm also questioning our guy here, Colts Walter Picks, on this one. Let me, because it's a year of this. Let's see. Yeah, Hold we on. could fact check this I'm guy. fact checking. Hold on. Oh, okay. Fun fact. This guy was... His first team was with the Cowboys, but he had a long NFL career. So it's not Dan Bailey. Not Dan Bailey. It's not Nick Folk. Not Nick Folk. Uh, I think he had one of the more famous misses in playoff history, if I remember this correctly. Not the botched Romo snap, was it? No. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm misremembering that miss field goal. Anyways, uh, let's see. Oh, no, he missed 2011 AFC Championship game. He had a, in the closing seconds, missed a field goal in the AFC Championship. I got nothing. Billy Cundiff. Billy Cundiff. Oh, man. 2003 against the Giants made seven of eight field goals. Billy Cundiff. Wow. I haven't heard that name in years. All right, the last one, defense special teams, pretty easy. The reason I say it's easy is because it's recent. Like a performance? So team performance, yeah. So defensive and special teams against a certain team. Uh, I'm going to say what they did to the Colts. No. It was really? this year. It was this past season. It wasn't the Colts game? No. They had like four touchdowns on defense. They also had, well, think special teams too. This past season. Really making this tough here, Joe. Don't blame me. Blame Colts.WalterPicks on TikTok. Really put me on the spot here. Oh, man. Uh, Last year wasn't the Colts game. I'll give you a hint. Deron Bland had an interception return for a touchdown in this game. (laughs) Well, that narrows it down to, what, nine, ten games? Nine games? (laughs) Five. Um, Oh. Oh, uh, against the Giants? Yep, the season opener against the Giants. The 40 oh. nothing. Uh, Noah Igbenogany block kick. Juan A. Thomas kick uh, returned to, for the first touchdown of the season. Oh, no, Juan A. Thomas block. Noah Igbenogany return. First touchdown of the season. That was, probably the, that was probably the biggest contribution the Cowboys got from drafting Kelvin Joseph and then trading him for Noah Igbenogany. Fun fact, Kelvin jo- Joseph also has a dead cap hit this coming season. Okay, on that note, um, let's go to uh, the Cowboys' chase for the Rose, okay? Um, Joey, do you want to give us a quick rundown of who we got on this bracket left? I would love to. So we have 
Tali Fu. I don't. I don't know if you're pronouncing his name right. By the way, I think it's Talisi Fuaga. I don't. Is think am so. I wrong? I I think you are. All right, we'll look it up. Because I there's a video of him doing it on NFL Network somewhere. Tali right? essay? I think it's Tali. No, I think. It's... Yeah, Talisi. I. We'll look it up. We'll look it up. Fuaga versus Armarius Mims in the one versus eight seed. Okay. okay. And then we have 12 seed Graham Barton of Duke versus 13 seed Jackson Powers Johnson of Joe's home in Oregon. We have three seed Olu Fashinu versus six seed Liatu, Liatu Latu of UCLA. And then we have seven seed Byron Murphy, the second, the Texas Longhorn versus left tackle Troy Fautanu out of Washington as a two seed. There you go. Um, so one thing I figured before we dive into this one more time, because there's a lot of offensive tackles on the board, mm-hmm. and one of the main things that the Cowboys might do at 24 is pick Tyron Smith's replacement. So I thought it'd be fun to go back to his scouting report from call, or from when he was in the NFL draft to give a little perspective of what maybe Dallas could be looking for in a first-round offensive tackle. Mm-hmm. So this is courtesy of NFL.com. Um, I'll read through this pretty quick. Smith is one of the best prospects on the hoof in this class, blessed with an ideal NFL frame and has the outstanding feet and athleticism necessary to be a starting left tackle. He does a great job of staying in front of speed rushers, locks on and sustains and can anchor against the bull rush, shows solid power in the running game and is really productive out in space. Football IQ is lacking, (laughs) fails to find his target at times in the running games and is a tick slow recognizing blitzes. Smith could come off the board early in the first round due to his rare physical gifts. So to your point last podcast, Danny, a guy that, you know, wasn't the most perfect squeaky clean prospect, but who are, but the rare physical pro- uh, traits is something that what we know now, but like is kind of worth reminding that that's a guy that grew into becoming the perennial pro bowler and likely hall of famer that he was with Dallas. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like as fans, myself included, we think we're guilty of, we want that immediate production. We want, we took a guy at 24 plug and play pro bowler. We want to see it. And I think we have to remind ourselves sometimes that these guys are coming out 18, 19, 20 years old. They're still pretty young and it's going to take time to develop. And Tyron Smith is a perfect example of that. One thing I found pretty funny in his draft profile as a weakness as can be beat by speed to power pass rushing moves. Um, that couldn't be farther from the truth if you watch that guy now or in his prime. I don't know about current Tyron Smith, but it just goes to show we get lost in these draft notes and what these experts think. Um, and we kind of write these guys off too soon. But uh, yeah, you just got to give it some time and draft and let these guys develop into what they can be. All right. With well, that being said, we have the first matchup in our chase for the Rose is two offensive tackles against each other. So we got Fuaga from Oregon State versus Amarius Mims in Georgia. Um, a little rundown here. Uh, Fuaga had the second best overall pro football focus grade last season among qualified tackles. He had the highest run blocking grade, which is, if you go watch him, is pretty evident. Um, it's fun to watch offensive linemen decleat poor linebackers and safeties in space. <laughs> Um, as someone who used to get decleated a lot by bigger guys, like in, it's pretty fun. Um, he allowed 12 pressures last season, but no sacks. One note about Fuaga played right tackle instead of left tackle. Um, another thing about Mims, as we know, only had eight starts in three seasons due to, you know, injuries and other things in Georgia. Um, he allowed just one pressure, though, that entire time. Another thing about him was also a right tackle. And he is a monster in terms of size, six foot eight, six seven. Uh, absolute freak. All right, Danny. I think I staked my claim about Mims in the first episode when he wrongfully moved on over my man, (laughs) Tyler Guyton, but, uh, what are you going to do? Um, I think, I think Fuaga is the guy here. Um, I think you posted a clip on your, on your Twitter the other day, or might've been today of, uh, Fuaga in the run game. And that's a missing element. Um, no offense to to Terrence Steele, he's 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 good, but just to see that attitude and like that Mauler, just I'm bigger than you, I'm going to run you over. That Fuaga brings. 
I love it. We need it. Um, I think he's the guy. You know, there's kind of a, we'll talk about more guys. There's kind of a constant of dudes that can run block uh, that are, there are going to be available for potentially for the Cowboys at 24. As we know, Fuaga probably not going to be there at 24. No. If he fell, it would be incredible um, for the Cowboys. Um, Cause I don't know about you, Danny, I'm envisioning just, and I know he played right tackle, but moving to the left, um, even hypothetically, if you think Tyler Smith is a better tackle than him, and you want to go Tyler Smith left tackle and him at guard because you just worry about his ability to get beat in the speed rush. That's possible. That gives you that option. Um, those two, though, together on combo blocks and <laughs> and getting in pulling and, and kind of with that oh, speed yeah. and, and tenacity, uh, I don't think we'd have to worry too much about Dallas's running game moving forward on the no, left you side. Could, you could run behind that left side all day, all day. All right. Well, I think we're in agreement here. Uh, the third eye Raven, Joey himself, the breaker of ties, stay in your cave. You're not coming out. Um, we have a winner in this round. Talisi, or however you say it, Fuaga is moving on. Um, Taliese. T Fuaga. Uh, what's the T? Um, he's moving on. All right. Interesting one because this now might be two centers going up against each other. And it's two Cinderella's, um, at least according to the rankings. Uh, 12 seed Graham Barton from Duke and 13 seed Oregon's Jackson Powers Johnson. Um, Danny, any, what are your f- initial thoughts on, on, on this matchup? Uh, as we, we made it pretty clear that uh, JPJ is kind of one of our darlings in this draft process. Uh, I did see a tweet that it's reported that uh, NFL scouts aren't quite as high on JPJ as media is making him out to be. Did you see something like that? I forgot. Yeah. I forgot who tweeted in um, or where it even came from, but I think between that, there's also been a lot of like draft talk about his injury concerns, which weren't a thing. It's funny. Sometimes in the draft process, things that were not a concern in college when they were actually playing are now like popping up um, to, to the affected or to the reality of that. I don't know. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's at least a conversation point in the media right now, externally. Yeah, and ideally you're drafting both of these guys with the intention that they're going to be your starting center day one. And uh, while Biotish was a good and serviceable center, I think one of his weaknesses was he wasn't stout against the bull rush. Bigger nose tackles have their way with him sometimes. And unfortunately, I can see that happening with Graham Barton. Um, I think we need more of a bulldozer, road grader type up the middle. And JPJ brings that. He's also got experience playing guard. So if you had to, if you had to put Brock Hoffman um, or other options in there, you could. But JPJ is my guy. And it's not a shocker that he's my guy too. I I just, I I think that we talked a lot about, and it's kind of interesting because they're both really big potential centers um, that are very athletic, both of them. Um, I think the difference maker for me here is Jackson Powers Johnson's ability to anchor against bull, against power for power rushes mm-hmm. from the interior. Um, you know, that's going to be, you know, I think that that's going to be key, especially, you know, for Dak Prescott and being able to step up. Um, if you have Graham Barton or whoever the center kind of sliding back into him, that might create some problems. I think you give Dak Prescott a clean pro, clean pocket to throw from. If you draft JPJ, Inter- internally and you also get a guy that can get to the second level with some authority uh jackson powers johnson moves on joey it's getting lonely in that cave i know but you got to stay there okay no more ties this round but maybe next or maybe this next matchup uh between three seed olu fashanu and six seed liatu latu um i think olu is very interesting as a prospect another mammoth kind of big offensive tackle. Um, if you look at his career, he was really, really good. Um, I think he had 11 or 10 pressures allowed this past season. Um, the problem was six of them <laughs> in six hurries came against Ohio State. Um, kind of just they found a little bit of an Achilles heel with him. They attacked it. They were able to get after quarterback. Um, and it makes you wonder – against NFL teams, if that just becomes the go-to, you know, if one hole can be kind of, can kind of sink the ship. Um, 
if you're comfortable with if you if you don't think so, maybe he becomes a really really high draft pick because of his upside and potential. If that concerns you, maybe you don't take him. Um, and I think with Liatu Latu, I think you're getting the best pass rusher. I know Jared Verse is there too. I think Latu was the best pass rusher in college football last season, according to Pro Football Focus. I pulled this nugget. He had a pressure every 4.9 pass rush snaps, according to Pro Football Focus last season. Um, for comparison, last season in the NFL, Micah Parsons led the league in pressures, and he had one in every five pass rush snaps. Um, not to say that Leatu Latu is going to walk in day one and have a pass rush pressure every five pass rush snaps, but just to give you a sense of how athletic and how good he is again to the quarterback. In my opinion, if he's on the board, I think that's too enticing to pass up. I pick Leatu Latu in this case. What about you? So you're telling me if Olu Fashinu, if I'm saying that name right, is sitting there at 24, you're going Latu over him. Am I, I am. hearing that correct? I'm hearing that I correctly. Am. I, it's, I have a draft crush on Liazzi Lazi, though. And you should, too. Okay. You're a, he's a former firefighter, man. We've talked about this. That's fine. That, Cowboys fan first. So I'll ask you a question. Do you think Dallas had a problem getting to the quarterback? Uh, not really, but um, I think that they definitely had times where they could have had some extra juice opposite of Micah Parsons. I think when you had Micah, moving around and stuff. Yeah, that, that was kind of a good chess piece. But guess what? It also kind of put a sonar, like, no, you know, radar right around him. Where is he? And we can double to that. And I think that as kind of the season goes on, that's a lot of pressure to put on one guy to do 18 times over and over again. So I think that that would not only make their entire pass rush better, I think it would make Micah Parsons better. I can't and, you lost, and you lost Dante Fowler and Dorrance Armstrong. And you, need, you do need someone there. <laughs> Yeah, but I would say the biggest weakness and kind of a recency thing here, it's just stuck in my head from that playoff performance, was that just the gaping holes against the run. And yeah, sure, Latu can get to the quarterback, but is he really going to help that run D up the middle? Ah, I don't know. So for me, Olu Fashin is a guy where if he starts sliding down the board, do you entertain the idea of moving up in the draft? If you have a plug and play left tackle sitting there and he starts sliding to the late teens. So clearly he'd be my pick here, but I'm also saying that he's someone I'd be willing to trade up for as well. You hear the cave opening. That is the third eye Raven himself, Joey Alberti breaker of ties. Joey is the sensible pick. The one you go with here. The need at left tackle and Olu Fashinu, or are you too enticed by the idea idea of pairing two elite pass rushers together, which a lot of teams aspire to do, and not a lot of teams actually do? You're going back to that fun, Joe. Quit having fun. Fun, fun isn't fun. You know, I think that's what <laughs> the, you're saying around here. That was the most third eye Raven thing you've ever said. <laughs> Latu, obviously, the one thing I feel like that kind of pushes him back in the draft board in this draft class is the fact that he's had this neck issue. One doctor at Washington told him to medically retire. UCLA is fine. They said it's kind of similar to like what Peyton Manning and Daniil Hunter had had in the past. And obviously they went on to have successful careers after the injuries. So that's definitely a big thing, but also Danny doubling down on Olu, not only saying you would take him, you would trade up for him. And that is the more sensible decision, but I'm going to have a little fun. And I think that pass rushers such as Latu are guys that you just can't find that often. They're not, they're not, they don't grow from trees. You know, Olu has promise. He has potential. I don't think he, some people think he's the best offensive tackle in this class, which could end up being true. And I could eat my words and be very wrong about this. I think there's a better chance of them taking Latu and having potentially the craziest pass rushing duo in the NFL uh, compared to Olu working out and whatever. I, I think, I just think they can find a, a cheaper later round uh, person to either fill in at left tackle or you slide over Tyler Smith, the left tackle, and then you just have to go get a guard. To, to that about cheaper options, at left tackle, I don't 
necessarily agree with that. I think when you throw bodies at the position like they've done recently with Asim Richards, Matt will let's go. It's like you're banking on these later round, not as talented players to hopefully work out, which they haven't. You look around the league, the best left tackles were for the most part all taken pretty early. And so I don't know if that's a position you could wait. Isn't it the same with pass rushers? Other than you, you think of Matt Crosby, who's um, not – he was like a fourth-round pick. Daniil Hunter was like a second or something like that. But most all of them were first-round picks. I just think you can get a Dorrance Armstrong or a Dante Fowler third, fourth, fifth round. My opinion. Who says we're not? Who says they wouldn't do that? You know, I mean, but who says they also couldn't get a second round offensive tackle that they like? I one thing I think we'll have to discuss on this podcast leading up to the draft a little bit more. Who are some guys in the second round, third round? You know, whether it's a Houston, Patrick Paul from Houston, um, uh, the, the Dominic, uh, I think it's Puny kid from Kansas. Like, mm-hmm. there are some options out there. Christian Jones from Texas. There are some options out there if that was a scenario they wanted to go go with. And in this podcast and this chase for the rose we're going with that scenario thanks to the third i rate himself the all-seeing guy olu is out latu yeah. advances what a mistake <laughs> oh, God. undeniable though danny from a fan perspective that would add some juice to an offseason that hasn't had it i'm tired of juice i want smart all right juice hasn't worked for 30 years we need something different. That's fair. That's fair. All right, last matchup of the day. We have Texas's Byron Murphy the second against as a seven seed against the number two seed, um, Troy Fountainew from Washington. Um I think uh the funny thing about Fountainew in this case, it's actually an offensive tackle that the Cowboys could draft that played left tackle. <laughs> what a concept. Um Yeah, wow. Uh all right, Danny, give me your give me your take on the matchup. This is the toughest matchup for me because it's two of my favorite players at desperate positions of need for the Cowboys. Byron Murphy brings something to the table that Cowboys haven't. You could say Odigi Zua to an extent, but they haven't really had that interior pass rush threat since. Oof, God, I don't know, like Jay Ratliff or something like that. Someone that's been a legit sack threat from the interior. Um, and any guy that says he came out of the womb jacked, sign me up. I'll put that guy on my D-line any day. But you can't deny the way Faltonu moves um, and his versatility. Could be an NFL guard. There's questions about if he's going to play tackle, but you've seen him do it at a high level. Not the highest run grade, according to PFF. But, oof, man, I just mm, – this is kind of like that fun versus smart. Byron would be fun. Fautanu would be smart. Give me the left tackle. I'm taking Fautanu. Uh, at least you stick to your guns. I'm, I'm yeah. proud of you. Um, I'm also going to stick to my guns, though, and go for a fun pick here. And I think that Byron Murphy would be exceptionally fun. I think – we've talked about it, man. If you can't stop the run – you know, you're going to be in trouble. It doesn't matter what Micah Parsons and Leatu Latu could do um, if you can't stop the run. We saw last year against Green Bay, Jordan Love said, hey, <laughs> hey, Micah, we thought we could have an advantage against you guys because you didn't have a lot of linebacker help, and we figured we'd run it up the middle. And guess what? They were so confident that they could take advantage of the linebackers because they were confident about what they could do in the first level too um, and get past mm-hmm. that defensive line. Um, to your point, I think that this would be an incredibly difficult thing Probably not actually for the Cowboys. They probably go to the smart pick and, and go Fountain in this case if he slipped all the way there. Um, I think that'd be a dream scenario, honestly, for them. But I'm just so enticed by the idea of the Dallas kid himself, Byron Murphy, staying in Texas. And to be honest with you, the com- I mean the, the comp to Aaron Donald is is not accurate 100. percent But there are enough, you know crumbles to make me think that it could be possible. Um, like, you know, Aaron Donald's 10 yard split was one, six, three. Um, Byron Murphy's was one, six, nine. Um, you know, he had a, his four, eight, seven, 40 was slower than Aaron Donald's four, six. Um, 
but also he had, I think vertical jump. Yeah. Vertical jump, Aaron Donald, 32 inches. Um, and, uh, Byron Murphy, let me double check. He had more than that. He had 33. So I think you're getting a guy that may not be as fast as Aaron Donald, but could be as explosive. And I think he's extremely strong. Um, 28 reps on the bench press. Let's see. What did Aaron Donald do? Uh, wow. Aaron Donald did 35. Okay. A little bit different there, but anyways, I see enough that entices me to kind of want to get a guy that can handle against the run and get after the quarterback from the interior. I think he pair very well with Osa. Um, and all of a sudden, again, another weakness kind of that they had, they signed Eric Kendrick, Eric Kendricks. Maybe that run defense starts to get a little bit stronger and we'll see what that could do to a pass rush too. Um, for the sake of the pod, for the sake of fun, I go Byron Murphy, but it doesn't matter what I think, Danny, and it doesn't matter what you think either, because the only person's thought that actually matters is Joey Alberti, the third eye Raven, the breaker of ties himself. I think you swayed me actually, Joe. I think you did. That's not fun. Think, Joey, what do you I, think? I think I'm going Murphy. I, I, what you said, and then just seeing 45 pressures from the interior. If you had a one technique and a three technique, you can flip flop to both. And you're getting 45 pressures from the interior. And then you pair that with Micah and Demarcus on the outsides. Where do you shift your line? Who do you double team? I like it. I'm sold. Maybe, dude, maybe you turn around and get Devondre Sweat, too, and as the true nose tackle. But then it's funny. But, you know, I, the only thing that about this now, I'm talking out of it a little bit. I'm still going to go with Byron Murphy. But from an optics standpoint, from a value standpoint, you did invest a first-round pick in Mozzie Smith last year. Um, he's had shoulder surgery this offseason. But that's still a guy that you liked a ton coming out of college. And especially – one thing I forget about Mozzie, Danny, is how – at the combine and just how big and athletic and explosive he was. I think he was one of Bruce Feldman's freaks. He's a freak. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't translate last year, but obviously he was also going through some stuff last year. The weight dropped. Anyways, we're going to stick with Byron Murphy, but Joey, what would have you, what would you have done in this case? I think this is the toughest one of the four matchups that we had today for sure. Just because they offer different things. Like you both said, the run game with, uh, Fatanu can't go um, unnoticed just in that he's not awesome at it, even though, like Danny said, and I completely agree, the way he moves is like just a sight to see. It's so fun to watch him go out there, like flying out and just being able to move at the way he does with how big he is. But Byron Murphy, great pass rusher, the pressures. The thing that makes me would have would have picked Fatanu in this circumstance, though, you have a lot of good defensive tackles in that second round range that if you go offensive line in the first round, then maybe you kind of work on that defensive line somewhere in the second. You got Braden Fisk, who had a really good year in Florida State. The Florida State defensive line was awesome this past year. You have Jerzon, Johnny Newton from Illinois, who is probably the best pass rushing defensive tackle in this class. I think – Fountainu, just the way he'd be able to fit in literally wherever Dallas needed them to, they could mix and match and experiment with him at left tackle or Tyler Smith at left tackle and just see what works best. It would give them so much flexibility to like have the chance to to see what really will be the best for their offensive line. So that's why I'd go with Fautanu. I I think I was just doing research a little bit more on Troy. I was a little bit shocked to see how low his PFF run blocking grade was because you see a lot of to to your point he moves incredible so smooth he's got a violent streak he loves to hit people and so i i don't have access full disclosure to all his watching and film so i can't watch it all i wonder if there's enough in there that makes you question a little bit on angles um maybe his ability to get to the second level actually I, you know i don't know like that was i was really surprised at how low his pff run blocking grade was anyways um, all right, so now we have a final four. Um, we have Talisi Fuaga, the one seed. He, you know, no Cinderella upset there. He goes on. Uh, Oregon's Jackson Powers Johnson, a darling of our eyes in this podcast, and many, many people. Um, I think he might correct me if I'm wrong. I think he might be the darling of like the draft, which is very funny for a center to be that. I, I swear, you see teams, Eagles fans want him, <laughs> Steelers fans want him. All these fans want him. Dolphins want him. Centers are sexy now, Joe. Centers are sexy. 2024. 
That's the the Danny Morales slogan. Make sure um, it's sexy again. <laughs> Uh, all right, UCLA's Layatu Latu. We're having fun with that one over Olu Fashinu to the Final Four. And then Byron Murphy also to the Final Four out of Texas. So that means a left tackle or a right tackle from where he played in college, but probably a left tackle in the NFL, a center, a defensive end, and a defensive lineman make it all the way to the Final Four. I think that's a pretty fun mix. Yeah. I like it. All right. Um, that wraps up another episode of how about that podcast. Um, thank you everyone for listening. Reminder, we now have an incentivized Taco Bell mile challenge. Um, if we get 2000 downloads by May 15th, I don't think that that's too crazy. You'll see me eating a variety of Taco Bell items before running a lap, uh, four laps, ultimately a mile, um, likely puking my brains out, but for the sake of content, some things have to be done. You got to do what you got to do, man. That's and you're next. And you're next. I don't know what yours is going to be, but we'll get you too once we hit this mark because I'm very confident we're going to hit that mark. Um, but thank you again. I, I'm Joseph Hoyt. Thank you, yeah. Danny Morales, yeah. Joey Alberti, the third eye raven, this breaker of ties himself. Um, go check out our content on LoneStarLive.com um, and tune in again uh, for another episode of How About That Podcast coming on Monday. Thank you again.